stand with us, turn to page 444, Heaven's Jubilee. Let's sing all three verses this morning, page 444. Thanking you, Lord, for this opportunity, God, to gather out in your house. Lord, we thank you for all these that have come this way this morning, God. We just trust and pray, Lord, that we've we've come, Lord, with a with an open heart, an open mind, Lord, come to receive what you have for us this morning, God. And I pray, Lord, that you might ever give me a greater burden. Lord, for lost souls, Lord, I, I pray for this, not only this service, Lord, but for the revival services coming up. God, I pray for lost souls, Lord, and I just, I thank you for your word, Lord, and thank you for how it speaks to our hearts, God, and convict us, Lord, and just gives us what we need, Lord, and I just pray, 
Lord, for these requests that's been made mention. Lord, there's so many needs. Lord, they're sick. and Lord, those that are sin sick. Most of all, God, I just pray a special blessing upon their hearts and their lives, God. And I just thank you for this church. Bless this offering, Lord, and just go with us and lead God and direct. Lord, these things we ask in your precious name. Amen. Page 37. He touched me. Page 37. We celebrate the, um, the independence, our declaration of independence, and what eventually would led to a nation that was truly blessed by God. But, you know, the real freedom this morning is in what the second verse says, you know, since I met this blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole. That's where true freedom lies today. It doesn't lie in the military. It doesn't rely on the government. But true freedom today relies in a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If we have that relationship, well, we should sing it and shout it while eternity rolls that he touched us. Amen. That we are free from the bondage. We're free from the penalty of sin this morning. Isn't that good to know? Amen. Amen. That's good to know. Let's sing on that second verse this morning about that freedom. <clears throat> Oh 
one, two.
God can hear. Spoken weakly, child, have no fear. Our God can hear. Spoken You know, I was, uh, as they were singing that, I was, got to thinking about how many times have we just been, just been laying in the bed, not audibly saying anything, but just pouring our heart out to God. Our God can hear those prayers. Our God can hear those prayers. We, we serve a great God. But this morning we have Brother Ross Lightvold with us. And all right, I pronounced the last name right. I got it all right. Very good. So we look forward to hearing from Ross. He is, uh, he is quite the energetic one, and we, uh, we like that. We like that. But I was reminded of something in our Sunday school this morning when Jesus was talking about forgiveness. He started out the verse, take heed. So, as Brother Ross comes to deliver us the words of salvation and eternal life, take heed. Take heed. And those that have ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear. Brother Ross, come on. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Hey, that's great. Um, so today, well, we're, we know that July 4th is coming up. You know, tomorrow, big fireworks. I already had some fireworks last night. It was pretty interesting. We almost blew up a house that was our neighbor's because one of them got misdirected. So it's a pretty entertaining time. But I, I love 4th of July. It's one of my favorite times. It's also sort of sad in a way, too, because for us in school, it's like, oh, man, like we're halfway through summer. But, you know, it's exciting. We have pool parties and everything like that. But today is also a very exciting day of July 3rd because it is my great cousin Caitlin's birthday today. So that is super exciting. So I want us all before, yeah, let's, well, great 20 years. And so before my message, I just want us all to sing happy birthday to Caitlin. I promised her that I would do this, and I think she sort of doubted me. So let's sing. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Caitlin. Happy birthday to you. Woo. All right. Now that's good. Let's, let's get to the message. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, it's such an honor and a privilege to be able to come up here and to be able to preach and to be able to deliver God's message. You know, um, Sometimes I feel like maybe we might trivialize it a little bit and just sort of do this because we come here every single week. We expect to hear a message from the Word of God, but just how awesome an opportunity it is to have a message from God who created everything that we see here, who is greater and more powerful than anything we can possibly imagine, and yet he still loves us so much that he, he took time, he took almost 1,600 years to give us the messages in the Bible and to give us his heart to allow us to be able to know him and to be able to have a relationship with him. So it's my prayer today that as we look here in the Bible that we understand a greater aspect of who God is and that ultimately it would bring our hearts to worship and it would bring our lives in a place that we can better serve him. So before we get into the message, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's an absolutely awesome opportunity to be able to come here and to worship you together as a church. Lord, I thank you so much for the church that you have, that you have called in this world to represent your name. And that it's not just this local assembly that we have here, but that you have a church everywhere in the world. And that there are millions of people today who are gathering together to sing praises to you 
and to represent your name. And so, Lord, as we come here today, we are going to be looking in your word, and we know our hearts don't necessarily want that, and our hearts sort of want to do our own thing and to live lives the way that we want it to live. But, Lord, we know that your way is better and that Satan tries to tempt us to think that it's not, that, that our ways are better than your ways. But, Lord, thank you so much that you are high and that you are powerful and that you are all-knowing as we're going to be talking about today. And that, um, that just brings our heart to worship and that brings rest and peace into our lives. And, Father, I just pray that today that you would just allow us to be able to understand your word and to be open to it and that we would worship you and everything done. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're going to be in one of my personal favorite psalms in Psalm 139. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Psalm 139. And as you're turning there, I want you to think um, a very deep question. I was um, pondering this the other day of who is God? And you know, that's sort of like a, a dangerous question. You know, you're just like, oh man, um, if you ask people on the street who God is, you're going to get a whole bunch of different answers. You're going to get some answers that are really good, that are really biblical, and then you're going to get some answers that are probably pretty scary when you hear people think it. And it's, it's a deep question because I think a lot of us here, you know, we go to church, we go to Sunday school, we read our Bible, we can give a pretty good answer for who God is. But in our lives, how do we give that answer of who God is? It's really easy to confess something. It's really easy to say something. But in actuality, what we say really doesn't matter too much. What matters is what we actually believe, and then what we believe is what we end up living out. And so when I ask this question to myself, who is God, I could give myself a very good answer. You know, I've studied the Bible for the last four years in school. Um, I know the academic part of who God is. But do I really live out that knowledge that I have of who God is? And so when we look at Psalm 139, um, this is such a beautiful psalm. I, I had been reading through some things and... Um, a pastor of a, of a church that I go to on Thursday nights, he um, mentioned this psalm, and it just really stuck out to me of how powerful David brings the word here. And so let's go ahead. I'm actually going to read the whole psalm, and then we're going to break it down a little bit and see how we can apply these truths to our life. So you're in Psalm 139. I'll start in verse 1. He says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. And such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not thee from me. But the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did not see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in my book all my members were written, which in, content, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God! Depart them from me, therefore, ye bloody men! For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord? 
that hate thee? Am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And as I read through that, just the absolute beauty that David uses in describing who God is to him. When we look at David's life, like, David's life is crazy, okay? He starts out as a little shepherd boy, you know, like, he's sort of the youngest in the family. Does anybody have, like, are you the youngest in a family? Like, like David is, has a big family, you know, he has all these brothers, all these guys who are, like, really great. And so here's little David um, with all these great brothers. And so if you're looking at potential aspect, you're like, oh man, these brothers have got it under control and David is just out here chilling with the sheep. And that, that's not what I'm picturing for my life. I, I cannot even imagine being a shepherd, being a farmer. I'm totally not an outdoors person at all. You know, I love the air conditioning. I love the city. You know, I love people and just being out there all by myself with sheep. Like that is totally not my life at all. But David, David was faithful in that. That's what he was doing. And so um, things aren't, this is just sort of like a normal life. And, you know, he does some great things. You know, he kills some big animals that would have killed me, definitely, if I were out there. But he takes care of them with God's help and protection. And then you remember the story of David and Goliath. You know, he fights this big giant and he kills him. And so then you're like, oh man, David's life is starting to pick up a little bit. Like this is, this is pretty cool. This is pretty intense. He's off to great things. And you remember the story of Samuel where Samuel is looking for a new king to replace Saul. And he goes to Jesse and he's like, give me your sons because I know God has called one of them to be the next king. And so Sam, or Jesse brings his sons to them. Samuel rejects all of the sons because that's not what God had and God had in place for David to become king. And so you're like, man, David's track is really going great. You know, he's gone from shepherd boy to king. Like, how cool is that? That's such an amazing turnaround. And then we see the rest of David's life, and it's just, it's just craziness. You know, if you're David, you're thinking, oh, man, this is going really great. You know, I'm a, I'm a king now. I've just got to wait for, for Saul to pass on, and then I'm going to be king, but Saul still continues to hang on. Saul's not ready to give up the throne, so he fights David, and David goes through all sorts of turmoil with the promise that God has given him for him to be king. You remember he's in the wilderness. He's, he even goes over to the land of the Philistines, which is the ultimate enemy of, um, of Israel. And so God, he recognizes God's promise, but God's promise is not necessarily manifesting itself probably the way that David was thinking originally when he was going to be crowned king. You know, he had to suffer the loss of many of his great friends. Um, he had to be basically all by himself, um, running away and hiding. And all this time, I've got to be thinking, man, if I were David, I'd be like, God, you know, like the shepherd days seem pretty cool now. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go back to when my life was normal. And so we see that David eventually becomes king. And then while he was king, he made quite a few different mistakes. Um, he counted the armies, which ended up resulting in many people dying because of that. You remember he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had to suffer the loss of the child there. And so when we look at David, David is sort of just like all over the board. Like he's experienced great highs. He's experienced great lows. He's sort of experienced everything when it comes to life. And so as you read this psalm, you can see sort of the anchor point. You can see the foundation that David has that basically keeps him sane all throughout his life. And you know, you might look at your life as well too, and especially with July 4th coming up, we think of the United States, we think of America, and we think of election times and how crazy everything is, and you have people who are sort of like, oh, I don't really care too much about it, and then you have other people who are really intense about it and really stressed out and be like, oh man, I don't know what's going to happen. Or maybe you might be here and, and you have something else going on in your life or um, some other need, or uh, you think, even me, you know, I'm going up to Kentucky, I'm going to be living out on my own, I'm going to have to make my own food, like what's up with that, you know, and, and, that, and that's really small, that's really small, and then there's other people 
who have great things, just like the prayer requests that were mentioned of uncurable cancer and things that happen in your life that you just didn't see coming. That You're like, man, I, I serve God. You know, I, I do what I think I'm supposed to do. Now what? And so in order to handle those types of situations, really in order to handle every type of situation, what Psalm 139 teaches us is something that we need to hold on to our lives so desperately. And it's a lot of times what we neglect so much in Western Christianity because you look at all of us, like we all look great today. Like we all have a ton of money. Uh, I don't think anybody is worried about not eating lunch today. You know, we have our needs met. And a lot of times when that happens, we start to get really dependent on ourselves, And we begin to think, okay, I've got this under control. And if something bad happens, you know, I'll call on God if I need him. But ultimately, I'm running my life, and God's just sort of there in case if I need him. But that totally wasn't David's mindset. That totally isn't what this psalm teaches. This psalm teaches the fact that everything that we do is totally dependent on God. And so if there was one thing that I could bring across this message, just one point, it would definitely be this, and I think it's the theme of the song, it's the, of the psalm, it's the fact that God is greater than anything that we can possibly imagine. He's great, he's powerful, he's almighty, we, we call it sovereign, we call it omnipotence, omniscience, he, he knows everything, he's all-powerful, and yet he is intimately consumed with every detail of our life. And if that doesn't bring our hearts to worship, I don't know what else will. But you see, the problem is, the problem in my life is I can confess that and I can say that, but totally living that kind of life is something completely different. How does your life match the theme of this psalm? And so we look, we look at the first part and we look at the intimate knowledge that David expresses here of what God knows about him. We look at verse number one, it says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting, my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my way and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. We see here this intimate knowledge that God has of David. There's nothing that David can do that God doesn't already know that he's going to do, that God doesn't already um, know where he is. He can't go anywhere. He is, God has completely searched him. God completely knows him. And you think, man, that, that's sort of creepy. Like, you know, if you, had, if you had somebody who just came up to you, never met him before, and you're like, oh, hey, Lucas, how are you doing? You're like, wait, how do you know my name? Like, this is really weird. And they begin to go rattle off everything that they know about your life. You know, that, that's really weird. I would be totally freaked out about that. But you know what? God, is, God knows everything about us. And why does that freak us out? Why does that make us concerned? It's because the fact that we can live an outside life that makes it look good. You know, social media makes that apparent in our lives. We um, look for the perfect angle for our picture. We look for the perfect filter on Instagram to make our lives look as awesome as they can be. And that didn't just start with social media. That started um, way back ever since the beginning of time of wanting people to think the greatest of ourselves when in actuality we know deep down inside. And it would, it would freak us out if we could be able to read each other's minds, if people could actually know what we think, know what we say, know what we do when nobody else is looking. And David recognizes here that says, you know what, there is somebody who does do that, and it's God. And a lot of times we look at it and we're like, oh man, as long as I do this, you know, nobody else will know, nobody else will care, nobody can read into my mind, nobody can think what I say, but God knows, and God is intimately aware of us. And so a lot of times you see the Bible, the fear of God and um, just the greatness of God, and that causes us to fear because God intimately knows us. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And so you think of the most, the person who you hate the most, the person who like gets on your nerves the most. You know, we all have those people in our lives. We try to act nice to them, but the, everything that they do just drives you crazy. It seems like everything that they do is against you. 
and you just sort of think about that person and the anger. And if you were all powerful and could do anything in the world, like you'd probably destroy that person. I mean, you wouldn't admit it, but you'd be like, just get out of my life. I can't handle this anymore. And if you soak it down and understand that's, that's pretty much how we are to God. You know, before we were saved, we were absolute enemies to God. The Bible, in our, Paul says in Romans that we've all sinned and that there was nothing in us that desired God. There's nothing in us that would cause us to worship God. And so if you think about it, we were absolute enemies with God. And it's not like God is just observing us. God knows us intimately. He knows every single thought that goes into our brains. And yet, even still, he loves us and he sent Jesus to die on the cross. He sent himself to die on the cross so that we could be reconciled with God, so that we could be brought back to God and worship God. He didn't just cast us off. He didn't just destroy us, even though he knew everything about us. He loved us and he cared about us. And that's what David is praising here. He's saying, there's nothing that I can do. Um, There's nothing that I say, nothing that I think that you don't already know you weren't already there. And, and it's funny because, like, I don't know if you guys are like me, but sometimes I pray, and even in my prayers, it's sort of like when I, when I talk to people, I have these deep down desires, I have these deep down worries, but I sort of try to mask it. I try to sound like really spiritual God. I'm like, oh God, you know, I know you're gonna, I know you're gonna work this thing out. I know you're gonna work this thing out. But inside, I'm like, oh, I don't know what's gonna happen. Like, this is, this is crazy. I'm freaked out about this. I don't know what to do. And reading this psalm helps encourage me that, you know what, I don't have to mask myself to God. I can be totally real with God because God already knows. Like, I'm not masking anything. Like, he already knows everything that's going on. And it encourages me because as I grow in my relationship with him, you know, you can, when you grow in a relationship with people, um, the more you grow, the more you're comfortable with one another. The more real you get with that other person, you sort of let your guard down a little bit. You sort of feel like you don't have to constantly impress them, but that you could just be yourself. And that's what David here is talking about. This is what um, has really influenced my life after reading this, is the fact that I can just be real with God. Like, I don't have to try to mask myself. I don't try to have to hide my faults or hide my concerns or hide my words because God already knows everything and he wants me to come to him and be totally truthful with him and to be totally real with him. And it's such an encouraging fact. And then he's not going to cast me out. He's not going to say, Ross, I can't believe you thought that. You know, you're no longer my son. Like, get out. It's completely the opposite. He wants us to come to him so that he can provide that comfort and security for us. And David, no doubt, had many things in his life, as I said before, of everything going on that he doubtlessly went to God about. And God works everything out. And, And the security of it as well, too. You know, a lot of times, like I was saying in Western Christianity, a lot of times we sort of put God down and we sort of elevate ourselves and be like, okay, maybe God can help me in this, but ultimately I've got to figure it out. And so I I was reading an interesting book. I can't even remember the author now, but the title of the book was um, really interesting. It was, Your God is Too Small. And a lot of times I feel like um, our God in our life is too small, that we have too small of a view of the greatness of God. You know, David proclaims here that everything is in God's control. God is sovereign over everything, but yet we continue to worry, yet we continue to try to mask ourselves and try to make ourselves better to God, but he already knows. And so I want to encourage you guys to continue to study the scriptures, to know God, to realize that God is greater than anything that we can possibly imagine. And let, let's see what David responds to this. He's, he's laid down the doctrine. He's laid down what he knows about, the academic knowledge. And now let's look at how he responds to this. He says in verse number six, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. And if the wings of the morning it, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light unto me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee 
when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. David here responds in absolute worship. He understands the fact that God is completely sovereign, that God is completely in control, all-knowing, all-powerful. And he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain unto it. God is un unattainable. We can't grasp the greatness of God. Sometimes we try to sort of box it in and, and sort of try to contain God and think, okay, I think I understand God here and here and here, but really God is greater than anything that we can possibly imagine. And that's so comforting because when we have things in our life, when things in our life aren't going the way that we thought, we understand that God is greater. Now, David says in here that from the time that he was birthed, from the time that he was in the womb, nobody could see him. God was there. God was forming him all the way to the end of his life. God is still with him. God never leaves him. God is in control of everything that is going on. And that's so comforting. And that, and that truth is so great. And it reminds me of Romans um, chapter number 8, one of my all-time favorite verses in Romans 8, when it says that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And a lot of times we walk through life, we walk our path of life, and we think, okay, you know, these things are going great like David, then all of a sudden bad things come, we're like, oh no, what do we do? And if we haven't developed this sincere trust, this sincere high dependence on God, when life is going great, we won't be ready when life isn't going great. And so a lot of times it's easy to cast off this and be like, okay, you know, if something happens, I'll trust in God then, but right now my life is doing pretty good. But just as was mentioned before, you never know. You could go to the doctor and get diagnosed with something that you didn't see coming. Or maybe you might have a friend or a family member um, die or, or something bad happen to them. What happens then? It's, it's, it's not too late, but it's much harder when you don't have this dependence on God, this understanding of God's greatness and the fact that nothing happens in the world by accident. Nothing happens without God first allowing it to happen. And you think of Job, the story of Job, where Satan comes to Job and he's like, hey, I want to do this stuff to your servant because I know that if I do this, he will deny you, he'll cast you off. And he, and he couldn't just do it to him. He couldn't say, okay, you know, like we almost think of God and Satan sort of warring together and Satan doing this and then God responding with this and then Satan responding with this. But in actuality, it's totally different than that. Satan has to come to God and says, hey, I want to try this on your servant. I want to do this. So Satan never acts in any way that God hasn't already allowed and worked and is knowing the fact that he will keep you through this like he did Job. And so when Satan comes, when, when bad things happen in your life, it's not like God is thinking, oh man, how do I respond to this? How do I somehow make this better? It's the fact that God has already worked that in your life. He's already given Satan the permission to do it and says, go ahead and do it because I know this will make him a better person. This will make him a better Christian. And it's hard. Like, like I said, I can just say that stuff and know that stuff. And you know, like, okay, that's great. Let's go live out life. But it's hard when you have those situations come up, when you have things in your life that are totally outside of your control. I'm like a control freak. I love to be in control. I love to be the manager of my life, to know where I'm going, to know what I'm doing. I have my 10-year goal set, 15-year goal set. I know where I want to be. And to think of the fact of me not being in control, basically, like the Bible says, that we're not guaranteed another day. You can't promise yourself another day because it's ultimately God who does it. Sometimes it's a scary thing. But just imagine how scary it would be if you were the one in control. You see how crazy life is. You see the different things happening. If you're just depending on yourself, you know, it's set up for failure. It's going to be really bad. There might be some good times, but there's going to be a lot of bad times. And so with this understanding of the fact that God is in complete control from womb to death, that your course of life is already set out, God knows everything that's going to come up to you five years, 10 years, 15 years, and he's already orchestrated it so that you will end up 
being a better Christian so that you will understand God better, so that you will worship God better and be a better influence on other people's life. It's something to rejoice in. It's something to be happy in because we know that we get to be servants of the all-powerful God, that it isn't just a random life that we live, but it's a life that God has already orchestrated and worked ultimately for his glory and worship, just as Romans 8 speaks of. And so David is resting in this. He's trusting in this because, like I said, his life has been crazy. And so when we understand the greatness of God, when we understand how sovereign he is, how all-powerful he is, how all-knowing he is, and how great he is compared to anything else, the natural response to that should be that we love God and that we hate sin. You know, if we, if we love somebody, we hate something that is totally against them. And so a good way to gauge your life, which David is about to explain here in these next few verses, a good way to gauge your life is if, how is your love for God in relation to how much do you hate sin in your life? Because if you tolerate sin, if you think that some sin is, not, is okay, you know, like I don't do any of the big stuff, but this little stuff really isn't too bad, then how much really do you love God? How much are you really trusting in God's um, sovereignty and dependence like David is talking about here? And so let's look at verse number 19 to see how David views sin. He says in verse number 19, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee. I hate them with the perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. You see, David here has such an intense view of sin. He, he can't stand it. He recognizes the greatness of God, and it's like, why, God, do you have this sin in here? Why don't you just destroy everything? Destroy everything against you. You're all powerful. We just talked about this. There's nothing that you can't do. Why don't you destroy the wicked? Why don't you cast everything down? And you think of the wicked that David had to face in his life. You think of his sons turning against him, you know, and trying to um, bring the kingdom to them and take it away from David. And then you think of the wicked that David had to face earlier in his life with Saul trying to constantly kill him. And he's like, God, why don't you just take care of these situations? Why do we see that wickedness still happens? You're sovereign. You're in control. You're all powerful. You could just wipe it out. Why don't you do that? And the fact is that if he did, every single one of us would have been wiped out. Every single one of us at one time were enemies to God. And it's because of the gospel that we are all here today, all, all of us here worshiping God. It wouldn't be just because we looked at the Bible and said, oh, this is great. You know, I think I'm going to be a follower of Jesus now. No, it was the power of the gospel that transformed our lives. Whether you were saved at the age of four or 54, it, it's still the same gospel, still the same transforming power. Sin is not any greater at 54 than it is at four. You are still completely against God. You were completely, verse 19 through 22, people, absolutely wicked, absolutely sinful, but yet God showed his love toward us, and he gave us Jesus that we might be able to be saved, that we might be able to have a new life. And that's why we are here today worshiping um, in this church. It's the fact that Jesus saved us, and that Jesus transformed our life, whether you were um, what we would consider a great sinner before, a great hater of God, or like I said, whether you are saved at four, it's still the great glorious gospel, the fact that we did nothing to deserve God, but yet God reached down and saved us, and now we proclaim his name in worship. And that's exactly what he says here following in verse number 23. He recognizes this fact. He recognizes the greatness of God. He then recognizes the absolute um, badness of sin. And then he says in verse number 23, the same thing as he started. Well, he, he said he recognizes the fact that God searched him at the beginning, but listen to verse number 23. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And I want that, those two verses right there, to be our prayer today. Like I said before, we can know all this stuff. We can know the greatness of God. We can affirm that, yes, God is in control of everything. 
that there's nothing that happens without God ordaining it to happen, without God allowing it to happen. But then how do we live according to those words? How do we live when bad things happen, when things that we didn't see coming happen in our lives? How do we respond to it? How do we respond to sin in our lives when we're tempted to go away from God and serve ourself rather than the all-powerful, all-knowing God? How do we respond to that? And David here says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So let that be our prayer today, that God would search us, that God would know us. He already knows us. He already knows everything about us and that he would bring to mind things in our lives of how we are not serving God, how we are not understanding the greatness of God or maybe the dependence of God and and just allowing him to direct our lives and to trust in him. That we know sometimes, um, as the disciples saw in the Sea of Galilee, that it gets really shaky, that it gets really intense, but that God is ultimately the one in control and that he brings those things in our lives so that we can see that in a great and powerful way and to worship him in that. So like like I said at the beginning, I want our theme today and I want us to go out of here today knowing that God is greater than anything that we can possibly imagine, yet he is intimately involved in every detail of our life so that we can worship him and serve him. So let's bow our heads and we'll pray and then we'll have a closing hymn to dismiss us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for Psalm 139 and our lives. And if we didn't have your word, we would look out and we would see everything in the world going on. We would see um, these awful diseases, these awful um, people who um, murder people for no reason, and we would think that this world is chaotic, that there's um, nothing but a fear that we could have in our lives. But Lord, thank you so much for Psalm 139, that everything done is ultimately done because you have ordained it. And even though it might be very hard to understand while we're going through it, but that ultimately we, we do know this promise that you are good and that you are God and that everything done is ultimately for good as you've promised in Romans and that you have worked everything, you are totally in control of it all. And whether the situations are what we would like or what we wouldn't like, Lord, I just pray that ultimately we would know that everything done is for good. And Lord, we worship you in that today. We thank you for the gospel. Thank you that you have saved us, that we are together as a body of Christ to be able to lift up one another when we have these situations come up where we we don't know what's going on and that we have the encouragement of people who love you and to come alongside us and to help us in those things. And so, Lord, we praise you and we worship you today in Jesus' name. Let's stand and turn to page 303, page 303. So-